When people think of the Saturn V, they picture five enormous F1 engines lighting up the Florida coast with seven and a half million pounds of thrust. But hidden inside each engine was a machine even more violent than the flame, the F1 turbo pump. This pump had one job. It had to ram well over a thousand pounds of propellant every second into the engine and do it with such force that the chamber could burn smoothly at over a thousand pounds per square inch. And to make that happen, the turbo pump had to deliver about 55,000 horsepower, roughly 40 megawatts, through a single shaft not much bigger than your wrist. It was a machine that wanted to tear itself apart every time it ran, and in the early years, it often did. The first stage of the Saturn V needed to burn something like 15 tons of propellant every second, or in imperial terms, well over 30,000 pounds of propellant per second across all five engines. No pressure-fed system on Earth could push that much propellant fast enough. The tanks would have needed walls feet thick. So Rocketdyne built a turbo pump a compact assembly about the size and weight of a small car, roughly 2,500 pounds, that spun at over 5,000 revolutions per minute. At full throttle, it produced more power than a small electrical substation. The liquid oxygen pump alone moved on the order of 900 pounds of liquid oxygen every second, roughly 400 kilograms per second. The kerosene pump moved the remaining three to 400 pounds per second, pushing the combined flow to around 12 to 1300 pounds per second per engine. The pump outlet pressures had to exceed the chamber pressure, which sat in the ballpark of 1000 pounds per square inch. That meant the pump itself ran at thousands of pounds per square inch on its discharge side, an environment where cavitation, vibration or thermal shock could destroy metal instantly. The liquid oxygen side of the pump was the dangerous one. Liquid oxygen is dense, cryogenic, and brutally sensitive to pressure wave disturbances. Early in development, the inducer at the front of the liquid oxygen pump kept failing. Cavitation would form vapor pockets at the blade tips. Those bubbles collapsed with tiny shock waves strong enough to pit steel. At the flows the F1 demanded, those shock waves multiplied, feeding high frequency vibration modes that could rip the inducer blades apart. One early test article came apart so quickly that the instrumentation barely caught the onset. Engineers saw the pressure trace spike, then drop, then disappear, and when they opened the test cell, most of the inlet hardware was gone. The inducer failures threatened the entire engine. These were not minor cracks or small chips. Some units failed in seconds. Engineers recorded destructive high-frequency vibrations they could not even fully model at the time. They thickened the blades. They changed the blade pitch. They adjusted the inlet conditions to increase the liquid oxygen pressure margin. They studied the cavitation patterns under high-speed photography. Test after test, redesign after redesign, until finally the inducer stabilized. Once that happened, the main impeller could run smoothly enough that the whole pump began behaving like a predictable machine instead of a metal blender. This period, the inducer crisis, was one of the most stressful parts of the entire F1 development program, and it nearly delayed the Saturn V flight schedule.
The turbine that drove both pumps was powered by hot gas from the gas generator. It spun at around 5,500 revolutions per minute and delivered about 55,000 horsepower into the shaft. The gas generator burned a fuel-rich mixture of kerosene and liquid oxygen. Fuel-rich combustion keeps temperatures down, but it also produces a sooty, particle-laden exhaust. That exhaust slammed into the turbine blades at hundreds of feet per second. Those blades were nickel-based alloys, air-cooled, and designed to survive gas temperatures in the range of 1200 to 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. But even with all that engineering, the blades wanted to creep, to stretch under heat and load. If a blade stretched even a small fraction of an inch, the tip could rub the turbine housing and destroy the pump instantly. Clearances were razor thin. The gas generator itself was one of the most troublesome components during early testing. It had to ignite cleanly, run at a precise mixture ratio, and deliver a steady gas flow to the turbine. Too rich and the turbine lost power. Too lean and the turbine blades overheated. Too fast and the pump could outrun the rest of the engine. Too slow and the chamber would go unstable. Several tests ended with burn-throughs and scorch marks on the gas generator walls. Engineers refined the orifices, adjusted pressures, and improved ignition sequencing until the gas generator achieved stable, repeatable behavior. The main shaft connecting the turbine to both pumps took the full 55,000 horsepower. The bearings supporting it ran at extreme loads and speeds. They were lubricated and cooled by the kerosene flowing through internal passages. During long duration burns, bearing temperatures could rise fast enough to threaten lubrication stability. If the viscosity dropped too far, a bearing could seize. And a seized bearing at 5,000 revolutions per minute, with a thousand pounds of liquid oxygen pushing through the pump every second, would have been catastrophic. Engineers refined the cooling and material choices until the bearing temperatures stayed within safe limits throughout the entire two and a half minute burn. The Saturn V suffered from pogo oscillation, a violent longitudinal vibration. One contributor was pressure oscillation inside the liquid oxygen feed system, which could interact with the thrust structure. The turbo pump, with its enormous pressure swings and flow pulsations, was part of that feedback loop. The solution was elegant. Engineers added a helium-filled accumulator, basically a tuned shock absorber, into the liquid oxygen feed line. The helium bubble compressed and expanded to absorb oscillations. When the accumulator was installed and tuned, POGO was effectively eliminated as a serious problem on the first stage. The start sequence of the F1 was a delicate dance. First, the gas generator lit. Its hot gases spun the turbine. As the turbine accelerated, the pumps built pressure and flow. Only at the right moment, when flows and pressures were stable, did the main injector spray fuel and oxygen into the chamber. The whole sequence took only seconds, but an error of fractions of a second could create a hard start, a violent overpressure that could damage or destroy the engine. 
Rocketdyne spent years perfecting this sequence. When the shutdown command arrived, the gas generator valves closed, turbine power dropped, and the pumps spun down on their own inertia. Pressures had to decay smoothly to avoid backflow or shock waves. After flight, engines were inspected for turbine blade erosion, bearing wear, and signs of cracking or creep. Across all Saturn V flights, from Apollo 8 through Apollo 17 and into Skylab, the F-1 turbopumps never failed in flight, not once. The F-1 turbopump remains among the most powerful single-shaft turbopumps ever flown. Modern engines like the SpaceX Raptor and Blue Origin BE-4 use sophisticated staged combustion cycles with multiple turbopumps, but none push a single shaft at the raw power levels of the F-1. This pump was a brute force masterpiece. It overcame cavitation, destructive vibration, turbine blade creep, bearing stress, pogo coupling, and gas generator instability. And when it finally ran properly, it ran flawlessly. Every Saturn V launch depended on a turbo pump that wanted to destroy itself from the moment it started. And yet, it never did. This is the story of the pump that made the moon landings possible. If this helped you understand just how wild the F1 engine really was, give it a like and share it with someone who loves real engineering. It supports the channel and keeps these Apollo deep dives coming. Thanks for watching. See you in the next mission.